Hey friends, welcome back. So in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit more about glutathione and how glutathione levels are related to vitamin D. We've heard a lot about vitamin D over the past 20 months, but not many of you have heard about this very important intracellular antioxidant and detoxification molecule known as glutathione. Well, it turns out that there's research showing that low glutathione levels and low cysteine levels in the body are correlated with suboptimal levels of vitamin D. And we're going to review some studies that find that low glutathione levels actually predict disease severity when it comes to this current public health problem. Now, there's a lot of clinical conditions and diseases that are linked with suboptimal glutathione levels, but because many people are seemingly scared and concerned about reducing disease severity when it comes to this current public health challenge and the virus, and we know the virus is not entirely disappearing and is unlikely to be eradicated, so let's talk about solutions that individuals that have underlying health conditions like cardiometabolic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and advanced age, and particularly men. It turns out that all of those conditions that I just mentioned, including men, are at risk for having suboptimal levels of glutathione. And that in turn can increase the probability or likelihood of those individuals having severe complications when it comes to this current public health problem. So here's a few papers that we're gonna unpack and dive into. I just wanna give you sort of the big picture overview. But before we talk about the nuances, specifically about how glutathione is related to vitamin D function, vitamin D receptor binding, and vitamin D levels, and viral outcomes and viral infections, what I would like to do is just give you a big primer, uh, an overview about what, what glutathione level, what glutathione does in the body, okay? We have about three or four slides that we're gonna unpack here. So glutathione is the most abundant thiol or surf, sulfur compound present with inside your cells. The liver, it turns out, is one of the tissues with the highest concentration of this tripeptide that is comprised of three amino acids, cysteine, we have glycine and we have glutamine. So we're gonna talk throughout this conversation about the importance of dietary cysteine, glycine, and glutamine. And so it turns out that those three amino acids, particularly cysteine, are rate limiting in synthesizing the levels and, and creating and manufacturing this glutathione tripeptide. So this is very important for cellular function. So glutathione is important for all sorts of different attributes within the cell. It's made in high concentrations in the liver. It turns out that your mitochondria comprise and, and store about 10 to 15% of cellular levels of glutathione. And when glutathione levels are not optimal, there can be irreversible cellular damage. And we're gonna talk specifically about uh, respiratory distress syndrome and some of the challenges linked with COVID. But we know that all sorts of different diseases, including cancer, uh, diseases of aging, uh, we know that cystic fibrosis, we know that heart disease, we know inflammatory issues, autoimmune challenges, diabetes, and neurodegenerative diseases are characterized by low glutathione levels. So it's very important. Now, here's that slide that I was just kind of mentioning to you about the mitochondria. So we know that the mitochondria is an organelle within your cells. It's sort of like an appliance. You know, if you think about your house as a big cell, within your house, you have different appliances, right? You have your dishwasher, you have your washing machine, you have your furnace. Well, it turns out that your mitochondria is where a lot of cellular energy is made. That's the appliance inside your cell that is very specific for making cellular energy. So before we talk about the study, I do just wanna mention exercise because we're gonna talk a lot about diet, nutritional factors and things like that. And exercise is a great way, along with fasting, to prime your mitochondria, to give your mitochondria, you know, to cause this mitophagy or this process of autophagy that is specific for clearing this functional deranged mitochondria. So individuals who are sedentary, individuals who don't walk, individuals who don't lift weights, individuals who don't do high intensity interval training periodically tend to have mitochondrial insufficiency. We also know that the mitochondria within the liver can become dysfunctional and deranged. We're gonna talk throughout this conversation about the importance of liver enzymes as an assessment tool to look indirectly at glutathione status, particularly GGT, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. This is a liver enzyme that I've seen so many clients, their doctors don't, don't order it. They look at AST and, or that's it. Sometimes they look at ALT, but they often ignore GGT because most doctors, when they go through their residency, they, they are trained that you only measure GGT. Again, a common liver function test that is indirectly associated with a glutathione status, they generally were taught to not measure that unless a patient, if you, if you know the patient is not an alcoholic, there's no, per, there's no point in sort of measuring this, but I'm going to share with you data about the importance of GGT. So I just want to throw that in there, but we need to know Remember, as we go on, that exercise is so important for your mitochondria 
the mitochondria in your liver can become dysfunctional, and that is associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what happens in that situation is the liver enzymes increase, so that is uh, indicative of fat buildup, but also mitochondrial dysfunction within the liver. So NASH is another disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis that I didn't mention, uh, that I did not mention in that aforementioned diseases, heart disease, obesity, and so forth. That's also an indicator for glutathione need, okay? I know I'm talking fast. I'm going to try to slow down and get excited about this stuff. So thanks for hanging in there. All right. Here's a paper from May of 2020. The title here is Endogenous Deficiency of Glutathione as the Most Likely Cause of Serious Manifestations and Death in COVID-19 Patients. Now, this paper got cited, I think, 50 some odd times since this, this paper was published. We now know so much more about glutathione, particularly as it's related to vitamin D. But this image really conveys the story quite well. So if you're listening in iTunes or Spotify, you may want to check out the first three minutes of this video because I think this image is quite uh, compelling, telling. It's a great visual, particularly for people in your life who are like, oh, come on, eat more eggs, eat more potentially meat or whey protein because those are the sources of sulfur primarily in the diet. Or on a minimum, you know, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, you need to have brassica, you need to have onions and garlic, maybe ginger, uh, because those are rich in sulfur as well. Uh, but if you look here in the lower left, you see low glutathione intake. That is low cysteine intake in the diet. So people who are vegans or vegetarians may not be getting enough of the dietary methionine and cysteine that is the rate limiting amino acid to synthesize glutathione. Okay, so we need to understand that. And that part, that in part may be why individuals over the age of 65, have suboptimal levels, levels of glutathione. Because a lot of people, as they get older, they don't, you know, sometimes they don't digest meat as well. They're on a proton pump inhibitor or an acid suppressant. And so they're unable to assimilate and absorb some of the protein they eat. So that can play into this whole glutathione insufficiency syndrome, which culminates, as you can see on the upper sort of part of upper third of this image here, all of the, the hyperinflammation and the levels of oxidative stress that are linked with organ dysfunction and cellular dysfunction that is characteristic of severe COVID-19 and acute respiratory distress syndrome and multi-organ failure and all the problems, right? So the glutathione is going to help to tame sort of that inflammatory milieu or fire that's going on within the body, particularly in the context of increased viral load or increased disease severity when it comes to just diabetes and heart disease and all that. Um, now, as you can see here, as we move sort of to the right, uh, you can see that men tend to have lower levels of glutathione compared to women. Now, that's probably because, honestly, men generally don't take care of themselves as well as women do. Women are more uh, sort of vigilant about their sleep and the foods that they eat and the exercises that they do. Men are more likely, and I know this is sort of stereotyping, but, you know, drinking beer, eating pizza and not exercising and smoking, things like that. So, um, really important stuff. Now, I would like to transition a little bit and talk about this particular study in vitamin D. But first, I just want to welcome you all back. It's Mike Mutzel. As always, I'm grateful that you're here tuning in. Hopefully, if you're enjoying this content, and as I slow down, as I take a deep breath, I just got back from exercising, by the way, so that's why I'm all fired up. I hope, Hopefully, you got your training in today because that's great for your glutathione levels and your mitochondria, as we're going to talk about. But as you're enjoying this content, please hit that like button and share this directly with a friend or family member that goes a long way. If you have friends that have similar interests as you when it comes to health and nutrition, if you just send a direct text to them and say, hey, I think you might like this video or this channel, that goes a long way. Also, if you exercise, if you intermittent fast, or if you go in the sauna, my friends, you should consider supplementing with electrolytes. Our sister company, we've been working hard behind the scenes to create one of the most novel unique at-home electrolyte solutions that's commercially available. You see, when you buy electrolytes off Amazon or you go to the health food store and you buy electrolytes, oftentimes what you're paying for, you're paying top dollar for USP sodium that's often imported from China. You're getting non-chelated minerals. You're getting magnesium oxide or you know, really just not ideal forms of minerals. And so what we decided to do is create an electrolyte solution that features Albion chelated minerals, potassium, calcium, you get your magnesium in there, and you also get ancient real Redmond sea salt paired with taurine, which is also, by the way, a sulfur-containing amino acid. It's, it has relevance to this conversation and creatine. So this is one of the very unique multi-ingredient electrolyte solutions that is now commercially available on the 24th of January. So uh, up until that time, you can save by going over to myoscience.com and check out the electrolyte sticks. You can pre-sale that, buy one, get the second one 50% off. Again, if you exercise, if you fast, if you go in the sauna, you are sweating out healthy levels of electrolytes 
it's best that you replete them using some of the best ingredients that money can buy when it comes to electrolytes that we put together in here. So you can use the coupon code podcast if you just want to try one or if you want to get your second box 50% off, you can just enter two in the shopping cart and it will be automatically discounted over at myoscience.com. Okay, let's carry on and talk a little bit more. To finish up this conversation about glutathione and vitamin D. My friends, this is really fascinating because you have these two sort of hot button, hot potato, I don't know what the word is. You have these exciting nutrients that people are excited about that are very affordable. Vitamin D and N-acetylcysteine and glycine is super affordable, super cheap. Uh, I just want to add this disclaimer for any attorneys or YouTube watching this. Why I'm not in no way suggesting or we're not talking about curing, preventing any diseases, particularly COVID-19. We're just talking about improving health, okay? We know people with diabetes, blood sugar issues, high blood pressure, uh, you know, risk factors for cancer and neurodegenerative diseases, they might benefit from increasing levels of the antioxidant and detoxification molecule glutathione. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we're not talking about preventing or curing COVID. But what this study found, and the title here is Severe Glutathione Deficiency, Oxidative Stress, and Oxidant Damage in Adults Hospitalized with COVID-19, Implications for N-Acetylcysteine and Glycine. Again, these are two of the amino acids that comprise the glutathione tri for three peptide. The other amino acid is, is uh, glutamine. So keep that in mind here as we talk about testing and assessment, and we're going to talk more about um, leveraging the liver function test, GGT, so that you can have a better idea about if you would benefit possibly from taking N-acetylcysteine or straight up glutathione or, or glycine. Of course, as I'm filming this, I can hear my dogs barking, which is just uh, fantastic. <laughs> anyway, carrying on here with this study. Okay, so here's levels of glutathione for healthy controls compared to people who are hospitalized with COVID-19. And as you can see on the x-axis, this is organized into age groups. Now, what I want to point out here, you have subjects that are hospitalized for COVID between the ages of 21 and 40. So what you see here in the red is pretty low levels of glutathione for individuals who are hospitalized, again, with COVID-19, uh, compared to controls who are not hospitalized. And then as expected, you would see lower glutathione levels in individuals who are between the ages of 41 and, and 60, and then individuals who are over the age of 60. Now, here's what's expected, but here's what this study actually found. We expect individuals over the age of 65 to have low levels of glutathione. We know that as you age, there's this process known as inflammation that ensues. You become more inflamed as you age. That's just a natural thing that we can all get excited about and look forward to. Not really. But what was not expected is that young individuals who are seemingly healthy between the ages of 21 and 40 have particularly low levels of glutathione, uh, especially those who are infected with COVID. Now, why is this important to sort of unpack and talk about? Well, it seems that individuals who have underlying health conditions or risk factors, i.e. prediabetes, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, they're overweight, things like that, or if people eat junk food, they're going to have most likely, or they're going to be statistically you know, higher odds of having low glutathione levels and therefore might run into challenges when they are exposed to a highly transmissible respiratory virus like SARS-CoV-2. So that's what this study was saying is surprisingly, young, seemingly healthy people have low levels of glutathione, and they also have high levels of oxidative stress as per F2 isoprostanes. So F2 isoprostanes are a way to look at lipid peroxidation. We've reviewed several studies over the years uh, that have looked at uh, particularly overweight people when they get infected with SARS-CoV-2, their levels of oxidative stress increase. And so that's what the data is suggesting that young people who get severely ill, most majority of them, especially if they get hospitalized and so on, they tend to be overweight and have underlying health conditions. So this sort of corroborates with that, that data that we know, but also it suggests that these individuals that are, you know, youngish, but also have these age associated diseases, i.e. high blood pressure, diabetes, and so forth, they might be likely candidates to consider adding more cysteine and glycine and glutamine into the diet, increasing exercise and other lifestyle measures uh, to, to increase levels of glutathione in their body so as to mitigate potential challenges with their own pathological diseases that are, that are going on and to help add, add a little buffer or resilience should they get exposed to, to a pathogen, okay? So, that's, that's what's known there. Now, we don't yet have any uh, randomized placebo-controlled studies, to the best of my knowledge, with SARS-CoV-2 and NAC or glycine interventions. 
However, there is some interesting data showing that in people who are HIV positive, when they are given N-acetylcysteine glycine combination, uh, it seems to improve some of their, you know, under the disease sequela or process in their body. Okay. Now, let me just pause here before we go on to vitamin D and talk about timing. Uh, should you decide to take glutathione or, or N-acetylcysteine? And I'm not suggesting everyone needs this. Okay. Just a small plug. We do offer you know, third-party tested N-acetylcysteine, N-acetylcysteine products and so forth, uh, but that's not why I'm talking about this. I would rather you get your cysteine and glycine from your diet and then exercise and do all these things, then periodically consider taking supplements. But I think we can, there's a lot that we can do with diet, but I will link some, some things in the description below uh, if, you're, if you're so inclined. But I want to mention timing. Uh, nutrient timing is really important. Glutathione levels tend to increase uh, and your, your immune system in general is more active in the evening time and, and, and early parts in the morning, like one, two in the morning when you're sleeping. So I suggest if you take an acetylcysteine supplements, take them in right before you go to bed in the evening time. Okay, that's that's what I recommend. Um, and so anyway, keep that in mind, the, the chrononutrition or the circadian influence of an acetylcysteine. Okay, so let's continue on and talk about the interrelationships with vitamin D. Now, this is quite fascinating. This is a paper, I'm not going to go through all the different nuances and so forth, but this paper here, glutathione stimulates vitamin D regulatory and uh, glucose metabolism genes and lowers oxidative stress. That's one particular study. Another study here, glutathione deficiency induces epigenetic alterations of vitamin D metabolism genes in the livers of high-fat diet-fed obese mice. That was in the journal Nature. Uh, there's another uh uh, study here titled, Can Vitamin D and L-Cysteine uh, Co-Supplementation Reduce uh, Vitamin D Deficiency in the Mortality Associated with COVID-19 in African-American Individuals? Okay, so it turns out, let me just kind of go to my notes here. Um, it turns out there's a fascinating connection here between glutathione and vitamin D. And so glutathione correlates positively with, with vitamin D levels and likewise low uh, L-cysteine, which is the rate limiting amino acid to make glutathione, is linked with much lower levels of vitamin D binding protein. Uh, cysteine also alters vitamin D metabolism related genes. So there's a lot of connections here, a lot of correlation. So what can you do? Well, uh, I suggest measuring your your body levels of vitamin D. Um, you can go to your go to your doctor. Uh, you can also uh, our sister company Myosense. We have a blood spot at home test. It's really affordable. You can take that. Just see where your vitamin D levels are, and then I recommend testing your body levels. Uh, your, your glutathione uh, tripeptide (GGT) gamma glutamyl transpeptidase is what the liver enzymes liver enzyme GGT stands for. So this is related to glutathione biosynthesis. Now, as you can see here on this image. Up uh, where it says kidney, right below that is gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. That's the enzyme that you're measuring when you get your liver function test panel that we recommend. We have our blood work cheat sheet. It's on our website, highintensityhealth.com. If you haven't downloaded, please do so. We have our three liver function tests that you need to encourage your healthcare practitioner to run for you so that you know if you have an increased need for glutathione levels because it turned for glutathione support, that is, because it turns out that glutathione is related to the occurrence of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, and all of the all of the diseases that, guess what, are also linked with severe COVID. So GGT is a very big deal. I don't know why doctors ignore it. It is an indicator not only of oxidative stress, uh, free radical disease, and low glutathione levels, but it is an indicator, my friends, of heavy metal and persistent organic pollutant burden. Okay, so that's why I measure this in clients to see, to ascertain, hey, what potentially are your is your exposure to bisphenol A, to phthalates, to organotoxins, to dioxins, to persistent fluoro compounds and perfluoro compounds. So all of these different compounds, as you're seeing on these images here, affect fat formation, affect body weight, affect insulin levels, and they deplete glutathione levels. So my friends, it's really important that you understand and know this stuff. It's really important that you measure your gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, the liver enzyme, GGT, because this is an inexpensive approximation to look at overall oxidative stress and oxidative damage in your body and to ascertain whether or not you need to support your body's levels of glutathione. Okay, so let's say you do support your body's levels of glutathione. How can you do so? We have meat. I know your vegan and vegetarian are going to get upset with me, but just this is what the data shows. Okay, this is what the science clearly shows. Meat contains methionine and cysteine. 
That is the rate limiting amino acid that goes on to make glutathione, right? We have eggs, okay? So if, so if you can eat eggs, that would be great. We have whey protein. So we know raw milk, whey protein are rich in sulfur. We know that garlic, onions, we know that the brassica. So if you're vegan, vegetarian, you, you can't have meat, raw milk, or eggs, or, or liver. You know, those are all rich in cysteine. Okay, fine. You got to have a lot of brassica. I think mushrooms have a little bit of sulfur in them. You got to have garlic and onions, okay? So uh, I learned this from Dr. Dr. Russ Jaffe. We did a whole podcast on glutathione. But this is important. Now, when would you dose an acetylcysteine glycine supplementation? You would want to do that in the evening before bed. You know, you don't want to take antioxidants during the day, okay? Now, that's, this is well known. This applies, my friends, to vitamin C, vitamin E, all the antioxidants. You take them at night. You don't want to take them during the day. There's research to show from a circadian rhythm standpoint that is, is not ideal. So, where, do we, where does this leave us? Well, there's an interrelationship between vitamin D and glutathione and L-cysteine. So get adequate levels of L-cysteine in your diet. If you have digestive dysfunction, if you're a vegan, vegetarian, you might want to supplement with an acetylcysteine. You know, 800 milligrams to 1.2 grams per day. Add some glycine in there. Do it at night, okay? Uh, measure your, your level of GGT, your gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. It's a very affordable test. And also look at your vitamin D levels and, and try to optimize these. And, and there could be some, uh, there are some epigenetic issues uh, and connections there and so forth. So I think this is exciting stuff, especially because this is really affordable, my friends. Buying an acetylcysteine and glycine, really affordable, as is buying vitamin D. And we can assess these and personalize and custom tailor risk. So what do you think of this conversation? Was this helpful? I know we went through this somewhat fast. I do my best to slow down. Uh, admittedly, I got a little excited before you know uh, recording this week because I was exercising, but hopefully you found this helpful. I want to let you know that we have a part two of this session to talk about the glycocalyx, which is a function of, it's sort of this gelatinous like substance that uh, connects your cells together, so to speak, especially the endothelial cells. And it turns out that another sulfur related compound is very important for the glycocalyx. And this may increase risk for heart disease uh, and severe COVID and all that um, if you have insufficient levels of sulfur, surf, sulfur, excuse me. So that's coming tomorrow. I'm really excited about that and to share that information with you. But until then, my friends, let me know what you think in the comments below. I always like your feedback. Was this helpful? Yes or no? Let me know. And we will catch you on a future episode down the road. As always, thanks for subscribing. Thank you for sharing this video and podcast. And we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now. Yeah.